Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. Uh, in this video, I'm going to do something a little different, and I've been meaning to kind of revisit this topic for a little while now, but since I've been using the tool so much lately, it seemed like a very good time to touch base again on it. Um, I would, so, what is the topic? Uh, basically, what I wanted to do is show you some of the Hot Wire Foam Factory tools in use. I've been using them a lot for the Castle Project lately, and I took the opportunity to set up the camera and shoot some not great video. Um, I'm going to try to clean it up in post-production, but um, at least uh, some video of it actually in use, constructing some of the elements that I showed you on the previous video, um, one back from this one. If this is the first video that you've seen of mine, you should take a look at the channel and see the video just prior to this one, um, which shows some of the new um, features on the uh, on the walls and the towers that I added. Um, so basically, what I wanted to do before I show that um, the the actual in use video is just give you, especially if you're new to the Hot Wire Foam Factory tools, a two second overview of the tools that I used. Um, so at least you'll have some understanding of what you're looking at when you actually watch the video. Um, so first. Um, basically, uh, there's been, say, three main tools that I've been using. Um, the first one is the 8-inch hot wire knife. I also have the 6-inch knife. Um, the 4-inch knife could also function as this purpose. Um, but basically, I've been using this for raw cuts to um, chunk up the foam so that I can fit it onto the scroll table to do some of the cylinders that I was making for the towers. I've also been using the engraving tool. Uh, the engraving tool um, is basically a small point that just heats up so that you can score lines into surfaces of foam. Um, that's been super useful, obviously, with the mile of, of brick scoring that I've done. Um, both of these tools plug into a power source. Um, I happen to have the um, Pro Power Station, which is a variable rheostat um, power station, and accepts the different kinds of jacks for all the tools that they sell. Um, the 8-inch knife does require the Pro Tool, and the engraver um, plugs into the Craft Tool. They do offer, I, I checked actually earlier today, um, they offer the 4-inch knife, the engraver tool, and their freehand um, like sculpting tool in the crafter's kit with the craft power supply. So that will not have the variable temperature that this has, but gives you three really good basic tools that every foam worker should really have. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of a recommendation. But um, So I've been using those two. And then I've been using um, the sled a lot more than I ever expected. Um, when they first sent this to me, I was like, eh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Um, but I've been using this primarily to lock the engraving tool into it. You'll see that in the video um, so that I can fix its depth and have a steady point at which I can run foam against the engraving tool. It has been invaluable, invaluable. And um, the last tool, well, let's see here, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, do too much with this video, but I just want to show you a couple things. Has been the um, 3D. This is the um, I think oh, it's been a while now. This is I think the Pro 3D scroll table. Um, this is a little bit bigger than their smaller one. Um, it has two arms so that you can adjust the wire between the two arms. It has different configurations for setting up the wire, two holes. Um, there is under here retaining screws underneath this hole so that you can clamp the bottom of this wire in place. Very important. I'll talk about that later when I'm doing the cylinder, um, the outside cylinder, sort of a cylinder cut within a cylinder. But you can adjust the angle of the wire any angle you want. Um, and it's just, it's been an all around super versatile tool. It comes with um, two different plates that have um, holes in the bottom to insert nails, and then the nails can become a pivot point for the foam that's sitting on it. And this is required for doing the cylinder work. And I'll discuss that again a little bit later. But I wanted you to see the pieces here, you know, and uh, at least get a little verbal description of them. I believe when you buy the um, 3D Power uh, Pro scroll table, the name might be a little off, but you know what I mean. Um, it comes with um, two sleds, and then there's a retaining clamp that allows you to clip it on to the back. Uh, so um, for any of these uh, more irregular shapes, um, and you'll see I've been doing a lot of freehand work with it as well, uh, it's been um, really key for that. It also has a um, sliding guide fence in the back here that has adjustable tension so that you can adjust the depth if you want to do any planing work or thinning, which I also show as well. Um, lastly, I should mention that the 3D scroll table comes with a variety of wires. 
there's a ribbon wire, which I still don't quite understand how to use or what, what its intended purpose is, uh, but it comes with um, some uh, stiff wires that can be bent into shapes, as well as two different gauges of wires to stretch as a, as a taut sort of guitar string type wire cutter. I've been using exclusively the um, oh, what is it called? It's like the precision wire, I think. It's a very thin wire. It doesn't get quite as hot, so you can't push foam through it as quickly as you could with the larger gauge wires, but it gives an incredibly clean cut. I've been super impressed with its uh, precision, hence the name, uh, but, and I've been more than willing to be a little bit patient to push through the foam to really have some of that really nice, clean edging on the cuts. So uh, that's an overview of the tools that I've been using. Um, you will need, to, if you wanted to replicate this, this is not a tutorial, okay? Um, I, if I was gonna do a tutorial, I would shoot this totally differently and describe things very differently as I go through the process. This is merely an overview to give you some ideas of how some of these tools can be used and what I've been doing. Um, certainly it will give you some hints to replicate some of these pieces, but it's not intended to be a tutorial. Uh, but in order to do some of this work, um, it's very helpful to have a square, um, a speed square or something similar. This way you can check the uh, verticality of the wire in all directions so you can ensure you're getting a 90 degree cut. Um, and for some of the clamping work, it's also helpful to have a couple uh, quick clamps, especially with a deep throat, because as you'll see, um, as I move the engraver up to cut um, deeper scores, uh, scores up higher along the wall, I've been stacking it on bricks, and then I need a deeper throat so I can clamp the bricks uh, to the table and the sled itself. Much of this will be self-explanatory as you watch some of the video, but I wanted to give you a little overview and not lose anybody in the dark while we uh, take a look at the slightly underlit video of uh, me using these tools. So um, hopefully you find this useful. Um, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to skip ahead as you look through the video if you've seen enough. Um, and there's um, a probably five or six different segments included in this. I have over an hour of footage to condense down into this video. Um, so this will probably run a little bit longer than some We'll see. I'm going to try not to get too much, as much as I am right now. Uh, but um, I didn't want to break it up into multiple segments, as this way I can just have a single repository where you can see a bunch of techniques all at once, and you can skip around amongst it as we, as you see fit and is helpful to you. So um, I will not finish with an end uh, a discussion as well, so I'll say it now before we go to that segment. Um, feel free to leave questions and comments down below. I've been using these tools very heavily. Um, I've been um, any kinds of small problems that I've had with any of the tools, um, the Hotware Foam Factory has been super supportive about um, sending me replacements, fixing them, um, even when I think it might have been, you know, is it, is it just wearing out from user, you know, because I'm using them so much. No, 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 it's not supposed to do that. You send that back and we're going to send you a replacement part for that. So it's a very supportive company. I can't say enough about that. Uh, anyway, enough gabbing. Let's get to this video. So starting out. Um, I'll show some of these segments in real time so you can at least see the speed at which I'm getting some of these cuts done and then um, I'll speed up some of the process so that you can see a little bit quicker what the finished product looks like. But what I've done here is I have a two inch uh, block of foam that I've cut down into a strip and this is um, part of the battlement for the castle and using a protractor I've drawn in some semicircles I've scored some vertical lines into that and I'm using that as a guide and I'm freehand cutting these I couldn't figure out a way to sort of mechanically guide this kind of a cut so I've been practicing doing some freehand with the precision blade on the 3d scroll table which you see here and I found that because it has a relatively slow cut rate it's a little bit more forgiving for freehand work than a, a hotter blade basically that is going to uh, erode the foam more quickly should you pause in an area or try to make a small correction. So for this first pass I'm just going to slice out each of those uh, sort of semicircle rectangles and then you'll notice at the bottom of each of these points there are um, 45 degree angles and I'm going to nip those off at the end but I figured I'd just go through the whole pass uh, pretty much as it you know normally would be. And now that I'm done with that, although I'm trying to hold it up to the camera and missing, <laughs> um, now I'm going to go back through and just do the freehand cut on those corners and just knock those little bits off. And one of the things I've done as a small tip uh, is that I've cut this to be quite a bit longer than I actually need. 
Uh, and what I do, well, quite a bit, but you know, a bit longer. And then that way I can go through, especially if I've made an error, say on the end, then I can use that as my sort of scrap piece, um, chop that piece off and use the center sections that are the cleanest of the cuts. And, you know, I'm not entirely sure exactly up front what the dimension I'm going to need is for wrapping around certain sections of the castle. So having a little bit of extra material allows me to then, you know, cut it to fit basically rather than try to get it as a precise measurement and make an error and then have to go back and redo the whole piece because it came up a quarter inch short or something like that. Um, but you can see here, even at real time, it, it, you know, it, it makes relatively quick work, but because there's so many pieces to cut out, you know, the entire process can take a while. But uh, I was, again, really uh, been very pleased with the fact that I'm able to do this kind of work freehand rather than trying to set up a controlled angle for each of these, as, which would be, you know, incredibly laborious. Now, in this segment, uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to take that piece and I'm going to plane it down into a usable thickness. Now, you can see here, and I apologize for my shoulder getting in the way. I told you this wasn't you know, carefully orchestrated uh, movie shooting here. But um, you noticed I was using a, a, a square, basically. And I like to use a square against the fence just because I know I always get a certain perpendicular angle to measure from uh, to the point, you know, directly away from the wire. And so I'm measuring out that thickness. And then uh, there are a, a few screws on either side of the fence that I can clamp down into place. Uh, you'll see me doing that here. And then that'll give me a fixed depth at which to uh, plane the foam. And so now what I'm going to do is um, pass the foam through uh, the blade to get a nice thin sheet out of it. And one thing I didn't mention uh, when I was discussing setting up the table is the importance of checking that the wire is perfectly vertical in all directions. Uh, I usually check it in two or three angles to make sure uh, as if you have it slightly out of alignment you will get a variation in thickness with something like this where it's a rather tall piece. The taller the piece it is, the more extreme that kind of variation can become even with a very small angular variation. And one of the nice things about underneath the table where the wire attaches and it's not shown in any of these uh, videos but it's a screw with threads and the wire rests on those threads and it gives you a really nice kind of fine gradation to move it as you can sort of twist the retaining uh, bolts uh, what is that I don't know it's a, um, a, the hex nut that's what it is you can ad adjust the hex nut and you can sort of pop it out one thread at a time and there's you know it's a relatively dense thread count on that and that gives you a nice way to just kind of walk it out and of course you can always change the depth of the uh, overhead bar that's holding the top of the wire to adjust that angle e even more so it's not in terror you know it doesn't take long to set it up as perfectly vertical but uh, it is important that you check that before you do any kind of cutting like this so in this segment, you can see that piece that I've planed off now. I have a uniform thickness. I believe I cut this at a half an inch thick. And now what I want to do is score the surface. And in order to score the surface, I'm going to have to measure out uh, equal uh, segments uh, as I'm going to be doing a brick layer on this. And uh, my bricks are uh, one inch by one half an inch. In order to get an alternating pattern, I have to mark it off at every half inch increment. And I'll use that as a guide. Um, and in, in order to ensure that I have some of these lines centered over the points, you can see I'm using a square so I can make sure I've got a direct spot above it. And I'm going to mark it a couple spots um, so I can use a straight edge to, uh, you know, draw in some uh, uh, guides, for, well, to, to use as guides for the straight edge when I go to score it with the hot wire tool. Um, so I mark it in a couple places. So once I've um, got my center points for a few of the bricks, then I go through and I mark off, you know, uh, marks down the length of, of each of the points on a few spots to guide my straight edge for um, the horizontal lines. And then um, I use the uh, top marks at the half inch to uh, strike the vertical lines. So first I have to mark off all the half inches and then I'm going to drop down a couple points and then I'm able to cut um, using those lines to score the brickwork. And I use the uh, 
the meter stick, although I discovered, though, that this meter stick is actually not straight. Um, it has a very, very slight bend in it, and I only realized after I had done several sections. It actually, I don't think to the casual eye, you can really tell when you actually look at the structure, but I noticed it when I was trying to do some careful measurements with it, and I realized it, it, that it's bowed. Um, so check that your straight edge is actually straight. There's a, there's a tip for you. But in any case, um, it worked out fine for this. And if I had um, one more tip while I was doing this is that, uh, you know, to be careful when you're dragging the hot wire tool across the surface as the engraver, um, it, you know, I usually run it on high and it can be quite hot. And if it drops down and then has to lift up over some of the dips where there's no foam, I found it was digging in too deep in a couple spots. So I had to go back and be more careful about how I brought it across those points. Uh, so, you know, of course, one of the nice things about the Pro Power Station is you can adjust that temperature, but I find I'd rather have it up on high so that I can control the speed of it rather than trying to be dictated by the temperature of the blade. Um, so there's, there's pros and cons either way, depending on how you want to do it. And you can see here, while I'm scoring the vertical lines, that I'm using a, the speed square to mark those lines nice and straight. Um, and I've used some form of a square or a plumb bob at every stage of this to try to get my vertical lines actually vertical. Uh, it can be a challenge, and you have to account for the thickness of the engraving tool itself. You have to remember that it's, you know, say um, it's over an eighth of an inch wide, perhaps. And so uh, you have to sort of lead yourself away from the actual edge of the uh, straight edge to give yourself the thickness of the line but in any case with a little bit of practice you pick that up in no time and overall the brickwork uh, came out pretty nice and was done within a reasonable amount of time. Now once I've got all those bricks scored I want to bevel the top edge. Now, actually, I'll have to go back in and rescore the bricks where the bevel occurs, but um, I don't know. It's it's easier. I like to work against a, a sharp square edge when I'm using my uh, square to drop in the vertical line, so I usually do the bevel afterwards. But you can see here I'm checking the angle of the wire, and the wire can be adjusted, like I said, with the, uh, the overhanging arm. And I want to ensure that I'm just trimming a 45 degree angle, about half the thickness of the piece. So I'm going to eyeball that um, and then bring the sled uh, guide up against it, uh, the fence I should say, and then clamp that down so that I can get an easy, uh, you know, uh, easy angle just eyeballing it and then I can just push it right through. And in this segment, I wanted to show you another way to use the engraving tool. Uh, this is um, a modification of a system I've been using for quite a while. Uh, but in this instance, I want to score a cylinder. Now, you notice I'm using the plate with the uh, nail in it. And you see here, this is the previous nail hole that I used to cut the cylinder originally. And I can use that to reline it up so I can ensure that I'm getting the exact center of the cylinder again. And you can see here, I've already scored the outside line, but I wanted to show you some of the interior scoring on this. Um, so this way, I've uh, made some marks at various uh, you know, radii out from the center of the foam. Uh, and that I'll use as a guide for placing the point of the engraver. Now you'll see I put the engraver on another piece of uh, foam, a scrap cylinder foam piece, to lift it up above this piece. Now it actually, when it comes down flat, it will sit just about an eighth of an inch, maybe a little less, into the foam surface. And once it makes contact, I can begin rotating the cylinder and I can get a perfect circle scored into the upper surface. You will notice also that the um, sled guide that I, I clamped that to the traveling fence, uh, that way I don't have to worry about holding it in place and I can just worry about making sure that I get the right placement of the engraving tool and the right rotation of the uh, foam while I'm doing this. Um, and you may notice in the back, I've just used a, uh, a, a cheap sort of quick clamp uh, that has enough of a sort of um, width to it to be able to clamp the 
uh, the sled for the engraver right to the 3D scroll table. I found that was pretty quick and easy just for this particular piece. Now you will notice though that each time I put a new cylinder on, I do have to take the sled off the table as I just can't see well enough to make sure I get it in that, that uh, original nail hole right away every time. So I'll pick it back up, put the new cylinder on, bring it back over. I don't have to worry about where on the table I'm clamping it to because I have the flexibility to move the engraver itself. And then I'll just walk it over and I'll just score those lines again. Um, and I had to do that for um, three tower tops. Um, so this was the second of the third, second of the three. Ooh. I should add before I uh, leave this segment that if you wanted to score uh, vertical lines, for instance, or you want, you know, the if you notice the clamp on the engraver uh, that's holding the engraver, I should say, uh, that can rotate freely 360 degrees. So you can have the point of the engraver pointing anywhere you want, and I frequently use it with the engraver pointed to the side, and then I can drag large sections of foam along it you know, horizontally and get perfect lines for my brickwork that way. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty flexible tool. It's a lot more flexible than, than you might think to have that sled and add that onto it. And of course, any of the tools they have will clamp onto that sled uh, because they all use the same handle as their foundation. And I've used the um, freehand router like this. Um, I've used the uh, eight inch knife like this in various forms to be able to get uh, controlled cuts using the sled to control the um, depth of it as well as the angle that the blade is being held at for you know and then you can either move foam underneath it or move it itself and when I'm doing tall pieces I will um, uh, stack bricks and clamp it to that so that I can raise the height of it. Now to score the radial lines coming away from the center, you'll see that I've marked several points around the cylinder. Um, I actually use the compass that you see on the, the table behind it uh, as a fixed you know, uh, length, and then I could mark those lines around it. And then I just dropped in a little straight edge basically across the center and connecting two of those points. And then I can use freehand with the engraver to, to uh, score the actual radius lines, and you see them starting to appear there. Uh, so um, the, I will say, though, um, having a compass if you're going to work with cylinders is really helpful. That may sound stupid, but um, I was trying to do cylinder work without one for quite a while and struggling. Shocker. So uh, a compass and a protractor are your best friends if you're going to be doing any work with circles. <laughs> for this segment, uh, the last segment, what I wanted to do was show you how to cut a cylinder from a cylinder. This is how I dress the towers, both on the first castle project and on this one. And in order to do that, um, especially because I'm going to be cutting four inches of foam at one time, that's relatively tall, respective to the wire. So I'm really going to double check to make sure that I still have a, a nice square uh, angle on that wire in at least two or three different directions. And then um, what I do is I've, I've set up a little trick here, and I've made a mark on the back of the fence uh, with a pencil and I've made a corresponding mark on the uh, sled that will uh, be attached to the foam and I know that if I use that as my point I can always line that sled up once I lock the fence down and have a fixed distance away from the wire and since I'm going to be cutting a circle right I'm going to be looking for the radius and so what I'm doing here is I'm measuring to see if I have the proper radius to ensure that I can cut the cylinder to be um, just within you know a, a half an inch thinner than the actual cylinder I'm going to be cutting it out of if you follow me all right I'm going to cut a cylinder that's a half inch less in radius or I guess a full inch less in diameter than the actual cylinder I'm going to be using as my my foundation of foam so here you can see um, I've got a couple of my cylinders of foam, um, two inches uh, glued to each other, so it's four inches thick. And I'm using the eight inch hot wire knife to cut a hole through the center. Now I want to be careful, I don't want to cut to the outside edge because that's what I'm trying to retain. But I need a, a void that I can pass the wire from the 3D scroll table through. So the um, eight inch knife, four inch knife, six inch knife, doesn't matter what you have. Um, but you can um, bore out a hole, basically. And the hole has to be far enough away from the center that it's going to overhang the sled because I'm going to have to put it on the sled first before I can you know, feed the wire through it just so I can see that I'm lining up the, the hole with the original nail hole, I, sh I should say, with the nail um, so that I can sure it's still going to turn in a perfect circle. Um, 
So you can see here I'm actually going back and I'm reopening up these holes because I didn't do it right the first time. Uh, so I had to go back through and, and double check them and make sure I got them right. So I wish I had included in the frame the bar of the 3D scroll table. As you can see how easy it is to just unhook and hook it back onto the bar. Um, there's a little ring at the top of the wire and it just slips right over a bolt. Uh, if for this kind of operation, however, remember that I was checking that vertical line very carefully. And obviously if I'm taking the wire off, I'm at risk of losing that. So um, at the bottom of the underneath of the table where the bottom of the wire connects, I've got two hex nuts on either side of it on the bolt holding it in place so I know the bottom point is going to be fixed and then if I don't mess with the bar too much I'll be able to find the, the top point uh, and it'll be vertical and here I've put the sled back into the original hole that I used to cut the cylinder so that it's going to turn on the same axis as it originally did when it was first carved and if you go back in my videos when I introduced um, some of these tools I did cut a cylinder so you could see the original cut but you're basically going to see the cylinder cut again right here anyway um, but in, in this instance, it is important, and I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, oh, I think I'm opening up the hole because I was having trouble feeding the wire through it. Um, but it is important um, that, you know, to, oh, you see, I see now. <laughs> follow me here um, the hole did not extend over the edge of the sled um, because I have the nail back a little bit um, this the hole has to extend a little bit over the lip once I put the cylinder back on the sled so here you can see I'm cutting closer to the edge now to open that up so that it's going to be possible at all to feed the wire through um, once I do that and I feed the wire through, um, then I'm ready to begin the cut. And when I go to begin that cut, I'm going to be using the sled's mark and the mark that I made on the fence to ensure that I line it back up with my original position. And that's going to ensure, again, that I can control the depth of the cut, that the, the, the basically the axis of the cylinder will be at the exact same place it was originally, and that way I can um, adjust the um, uh, sled and, and slide it around and know that when I stop at a certain point I have a fixed depth without having to worry about measuring while I'm cutting because there, there I'm showing you the hole see now it extends over the lip um, but um, anyway it's a little trick um, using a little pencil mark on the sled and on the fence to um, help ensure that you can control that a lot more easily so there you see how quick it was to um, reconnect the wire and now all I have to do is power it up and I can begin to um, do that cut. Now you'll notice that the sled right now is a little bit away from the fence. See how it's gapped by about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. Once I heat up the wire, I'm going to push it back to the fence and that's going to set the depth. That's me looking for the pencil mark, which doesn't show very well in this light, um, but I, I am able to figure it out in a second. Come on, Mike. We're all rooting for you. Since there's so much to explain, I decided that I wouldn't speed up this segment. Um, but here, um, and now I push the sled back to the meet the fence, and notice I slide it a little to the right as we're looking at it to line that pencil mark up. Now I know what the fixed radius is, and I can begin turning it. Um, and then once I complete the uh, cylinders, complete circumference of the inside of the cylinder, we can pull out the core and we're going to have a real nice shell at the end. So you'll see here as I finish up the, the circle, um, then I'm able to slide out that inner core and what I have left then is a perfect one half inch thick shell that I can use to dress the um, top of my tower by sliding it over the existing core of the tower and that's how I created the battlements and gave it a reinforced look on its exterior. Um, as far as I can tell this is really one of the few ways uh, maybe the only way uh, that you could do this kind of work um, is with some kind of a tool like this 3D scroll table so it's really proved invaluable for doing some of the work on this castle project and I'm sure um, um, you could probably, um, if you're interested in this tool for yourself, you might be able to immediately see some other uses that you could put it uh, towards. So, hope you've enjoyed this, um, and, uh, and thanks once again for uh, joining me for another video.